Who was Henry Sidgwick? Henry Sidgwick, 1838 to 1900, was not so much an intuitionist as the first modern moral theorist who used a combination of common sense and shared intuitions to assess the competing moral theories of his day. As a professor at Cambridge University, he was active in founding Nunum, the first college for women. His wife, Eleanor Mildred Balfour, whose brother, Arthur, was later Prime Minister of England, became principal of Nunum in 1892. The Sidgwicks collaborated on many reform and intellectual projects, including investigations into parapsychology. Sidgwick's principal works are The Methods of Ethics, 1874, and Outlines of the History of Ethics, 1886. Who was Henry Sidgwick? Henry Sidgwick, 1838-1900, was not so much an intuitionist as the first modern moral theorist who used a combination of common sense and shared intuitions to assess the competing moral theories of his day. As a professor at Cambridge University, he was active in founding Nunum, the first college for women. His wife, Eleanor Mildred Balfour, whose brother, Arthur, was later Prime Minister of England, became principal of Nunum in 1892. The Sidgwicks collaborated on many reform and intellectual projects including investigations into parapsychology. Sidgwick's principal works are The Methods of Ethics, 1874, and Outlines of the History of Ethics, 1886. What was F? H. Bradley like as a person. Bradley was made a fellow at Merton College, Oxford. In 1870. This was a lifetime position with no teaching duties, which only marriage could terminate. Bradley never married and he lived on campus until he died. A kidney inflammation in 1871 left him careful of his health. And although he participated in the governance of the college, he avoided other social occasions. For instance, he turned down an opportunity to be a founder of the British Academy. Bradley detested cats and shot them on the college grounds, during the night. R.G. Collingwood His neighbor for 16 years, later wrote. Although I lived within a few hundred yards of him, I never to my knowledge set eyes on him. What was F? H. Bradley like as a person? Bradley was made a fellow at Merton College, Oxford. In 1870. This was a lifetime position with no teaching duties, which only marriage could terminate. Bradley never married, and he lived on campus until he died. 
a kidney inflammation in 1871 left him careful of his health. And although he participated in the governance of the college, he avoided other social occasions. For instance, he turned down an opportunity to be a founder of the British Academy. Bradley detested cats and shot them on the college grounds, during the night. R.G. Collingwood His neighbor for 16 years, later wrote. Although I lived within a few hundred yards of him, I never to my knowledge set eyes on him. What did Wollstonecraft claim on behalf of women? Mary Estelle, 1666-1731, and Elizabeth Elstub, 1683-1756. Preceded Wollstonecraft in arguing for women's recognition as thinking persons. Estelle claimed that women were entitled to be educated. Her reason for this was that women had the same God-given capacity to reason as men. Her justification for educating women was that this could help them be better wives and mothers. Wollstonecraft shared Estelle's views and defended them more systematically. She also claimed that the current treatment of privileged women as spaniels and toys was demeaning to them. She took Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, to task for claiming in his hugely popular novel Emile. 1762, that women should be educated to provide soothing pleasure to men. She wrote openly about female sexuality and the emotional vulnerability of women to rakes. Arguing that women were educated to be impulsive, emotional, and gullible. Who was Mary Wollstonecraft? Mary Wollstonecraft 1759-1797, is considered the founder of modern feminism in the West. She wrote at The time of the French Revolution and contributed to democratic ideas, generally, in vindication of the rights of men. As well as to arguments for the equality of women in vindication of the rights of women. She also wrote novels, an autobiographical travel essay, and shorter works on education. What was William Hamilton's philosophy of the conditioned? Hamilton called the condition something that has been described or classified. And the unconditioned things that are without descriptions or classifications. His philosophy was an attempt to create a balance between the conditioned and the unconditioned. Hamilton wrote that all that is conceivable in thought lies between two extremes. Which, as contradictory of each other, can not both be true, but of which, as mutually contradictory, one must be true. The law of the mind. That the conceivable is in every relation bounded by the inconceivable, I call the law of the conditioned. Hamilton held the theological belief that the infinite is incognizable and inconceivable.
How did William Wool describe the method of science? In his 1837 book, History of the Inductive Sciences, Wool described scientific methodology as a three part process. Beginning with a prelude of isolated facts, progressing toward laws or generalizations, and culminating in colligation by scientists during an inductive epoch in which a theory is created. The last stage is a sequel in which the theory is refined and applied to new facts. What were some of John Stuart Mill's achievements? Mill's father's interests and connections set the direction for his son. Although Mill ultimately chose his own path based on life experience and the influence of his wife. Mill's father, James, was a philosopher and economist, as well as an official in the East India Company. J.S. Mill also worked in that company until he retired when the British government took over. The company's administration in India in 1857. Mill edited the Westminster Review in the 1830s and was a member of Parliament between 1865 and 1868. Overall, Mill was dedicated to getting the educated public of Great Britain to accept scientific solutions to political, social, and economic problems. Although he also placed great value on humanistic concerns as informed by the arts and life itself. What did William Wool mean by the sensationalistic school? Wool meant to belittle the view of empiricists who held that all knowledge was the result of sensory experience. Or what Wool thought was mere sensation. What was William Wool's intuitionist moral philosophy? Wool, 1794-1866, claimed that conscience enables direct perception of moral goodness and badness. However, he did not describe conscience as a separate moral faculty but as reason exercised on moral subjects. Moral rules are primary principles of reason, discoverable by reason itself. He took them to be self-evident necessary truths. Who was William Godwin? Mary Wollstonecraft's husband, William Godwin, 1756-1836, was well known as a novelist and political radical. In his Inquiry Concerning Political Justice, 1793, he advocated utilitarianism and anarchism. He believed that the institution of government has an artificially corrupting effect on individuals because it creates prejudices. He proposed that instead of large nation-states humans should live in small communities without government so that they can get to know each other as unique individuals. 
only then will it be possible for human beings to feel sympathetic regard for their neighbors. Godwin thought that, because there is no free will, there is no point in punishment. Virtue, according to Godwin, was based on sympathy. And sympathy motivates us to bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of human beings. Godwin had no use for other values beyond this happiness principle. He also thought that rights were unnecessary because sympathy could do the work of protecting everyone. Was F. H. Bradley also an idealist? It's not clear whether Bradley was an idealist. Though he did believe that our direct experience of particular existence is what we can call reality. In his second major work, The Principles of Logic, 1883, Bradley attempted to construct the metaphysical system that would explain his ethics. Thought is embodied in judgments, which must be true or false. Ideas are the contents of judgments and they represent reality. Ideas also represent kinds of things. Each member of which is a particular individual, in the sense of an object. For example, you can have the idea of your particular pet dog, Rover. And that idea represents just Rover, but you also have the idea of dogs that represents all dogs. However, all judgments are hypotheticals claiming that certain universal connections exist in reality. For example, if one makes the judgment that dogs are good companions for humans. One is claiming that dogs in a general sense that applies to all. Dogs are good companions in a general sense that applies to all human beings. But such a judgment is hypothetical because you might have a dog that is not a good companion for you. Reality is the sum total of everything that there is in the world and as such. Reality is what Bradley called a concrete whole. One encounters reality by the experiences that one has. That is, judgments are abstract, whereas reality is particular. For this reason, thought can never fully represent reality. Another way of putting this is that the real world cannot be completely described and classified by us. Finally, in his appearance and reality, 1893. Bradley further explained that reality, as experience, is all blended in harmony. Bradley thought that relations such as bigger, smaller, before, and after our appearances, not reality. Relations are abstracted by thought from direct experience of reality. This direct experience taken altogether is the absolute, and, in a surprising turn, Bradley concluded that the absolute, or the totality of our experience, is the real reality, as opposed to something that our experience could be experience of. In other words, Bradley held both that our experiences are experiences of reality and that all of our experiences added up constitute reality.
What did John Stuart Mill think about Jeremy Bentham's pleasure principle? Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, had introduced the idea that the only thing good in itself was pleasure. By the time Mill wrote his ethics, this was widely known as Bentham's pleasure principle. Mill recognized the value of pleasure, but was more interested in happiness. What was Immanuel Kant's proof of God's existence? Kant rejected the ontological argument on the ground that existence is not a quality or characteristic of things. According to Kant, we cannot say that the sweater is red, wool, and it exists. He rejected the first cause argument as partly relying on the ontological argument. And he rejected the argument from design on the grounds that, at best, it proves only an architect or designer of the universe, and not a creator. Kant himself thought there was a moral proof for God's existence because the moral agent knows that he cannot achieve his goals on his own without God. The resulting belief in God becomes a matter of individual personal conviction not it is morally certain that there is a God, but I am morally certain that there is a God. What were Wollstonecraft's theoretical innovations? Mary Wollstonecraft developed the arguments of the 17th century anonymous writer who said in an essay in defense of the female sex, the usurpation of man, and the tyranny of custom, here in England. Especially, that women had the traits they did because of the role society assigned them. However, Wollstonecraft stopped short of condemning men for this or claiming that women were superior or equal to men in character or strength. Wollstonecraft's general contribution to political and social theory was twofold. First, in the case of women, she offered a detailed analysis of how their customary upbringing and assigned roles in society caused them to develop those traits that were considered natural to the female sex, emotionality, submissiveness, impulsiveness, vanity. Second, she pursued the assumption that reason could be used to improve human happiness. In both of her major works, she assumed that it was the obligation of rational people of both sexes to endorse social progress and human equality. Wollstonecraft's progressiveness was focused on the life conditions of those who were disadvantaged and oppressed. Which was not the case with leading male. Political philosophers in the 17th century, or even during the Enlightenment. In that sense, she was a revolutionary thinker. What are some of John Stuart Mill's influential publications? In his System of Logic, 1843, Mill added to formal logic a system of 
evidentiary proof to show how conclusions about matters of fact were justified. He also updated Francis Bacon's, 1561-1626, analysis of causation, and built on David Hume's. 1711-1776, theory that causes are not logically connected to their effects. And that causal relationships are no more than constant conjunctions of types of events. In Principles of Political Economy, 1848, Mill identified a gap between what was measured in economics and human values. Such as the preservation of the environment and limited population. He argued that the ideal economy would be made up of worker owned cooperatives. Mills on Liberty, 1859, was his most contested work because it was an attack on the leveling effects of social opinion. Mill thought that democratic societies imposed conventions on their members. That did not allow for much individual experimentation in lifestyles. His more conservative contemporaries objected to the freedoms of opinion he championed. As well as his idea that if what others consider a vice does not harm them, they have no right to interfere with an individual who practices it. His utilitarianism, 1861, argued for the greatest good for the greatest number of people, in which the greatest good is defined as happiness. His On the Subjection of Women, 1869, has endured as a classic feminist work. His last major work, Three Essays on Religion, 1874, was a rational perspective on religion, but was neither agnostic nor atheistic. Mill reasoned that there probably was a God, but that the amount of human suffering in the world made it unlikely that God was very benevolent toward human beings. Which of the other Enlightenment thinkers were most directly relevant to philosophy? Among the other Enlightenment thinkers of note in the area of philosophy is Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, the mother of Frankenstein novelist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. She contributed the foundations for feminist thought. Her husband was anarchist and political philosopher William Godwin. 1756-1836, known for his determinist utilitarianism. The French philosophes, particularly the encyclopedists. Contributed radical ideas about society and government. Voltaire, François Marie Arouet, 1694 to 1778, brought key philosophical ideas to a wider audience. Enlightenment thought in general had a powerful effect on the American colonies and the establishing principles of the United States of America. What was William Wool's theory of induction? In his philosophy of the inductive sciences, founded upon their history. 1840, revised, 1847, expanded, 1858, 
we will focus on discoverer's induction as used. To construct phenomenal laws or generalizations, and causal laws, or explanations. This is where he described colligation as a renovation of Francis Bacon's 1561626 principles. In colligation, the mind superinduces upon facts some conception that can be used to generalize. For example, we will describe the astronomer Johannes Kepler as having colligated the points of the Martian orbit. We will argue that discovery occurs not as the result of new facts. But in applying the right conception to existing facts. Thus, according to Wuhl, Kepler applied his ellipse conception to the facts. Of Mars orbit that were already collected by the Danish astronomer Tycho Ubra. We will believe that choosing the right conception to colligate facts cannot be done by simple observation or guesswork, but requires a special process in the mind in which we infer more than we see. Once theories are created, theories can be extended to what cannot be observed, such as light waves, orbit shapes, and gravity. In other words, we will thought that we always approach experience with something in mind that helps us interpret experience and go beyond it. What was Scottish common sense philosophy? It was the realist view of human knowledge put forth by Thomas Reed. 1710-1796, that what we know are real objects in the world and not our ideas, as claimed by David Hume, 1711-1776. Why was John Stuart Mill important? John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, is to this day studied most for his work on ethics, which codified utilitarianism. One of the three major philosophical moral systems, along with virtue ethics and deontology. However, he had important political influence, too, as a British progressive and also codified the empirical philosophy of science. His contributions to both democratic progress and the philosophy of science were so influential that they are often taken for granted politically and in definitions of science. Without a perceived need to trace their authorship, Who was William Hamilton? William Hamilton, 1788-1856, was a professor at Scotland's University of Edinburgh. He is famous for his philosophy of the conditioned in Scottish common sense philosophy. He agreed with Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, that we cannot know things in themselves. But also with Thomas Reed, 1710-1796, about naturalism. Reed's idea that we know things in the world directly and Kant's 
idea that we do not know things in themselves are contradictory. Hamilton believed that they could be mysteriously combined through intuition. John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, in an examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy, 1865. Vigorously attacked Hamilton's notion that scientific principles are intuitively valid. Rather than valid on account of their ability to provide causal explanations, as Mill thought. How did John Stuart Mill criticize William Wool's view of moral intuitionism? Mill's criticism of Wool's moral intuitionism was that it implied that morality could not progress because necessary truths are always true. Mill further claimed that Wool's necessary moral truths would preserve the status quo. And he charged Wool with conservatively supporting slavery, marriage without women's consent, and cruelty to animals. What Mill missed, however, was that, as with fundamental ideas in science, Wool held that we may not know all of the relevant rules of morality. Thus, discovering these rules allowed for moral progress. In what ways did William Wool disagree with Immanuel Kant? Wool disagreed with Kant. 1724 to 1804, in not limiting the number of fundamental ideas and claiming that we can have objective knowledge of the world as it exists in itself, independently of our fundamental ideas. Kant, on the other hand, held that we cannot know things as they are in themselves, but only things as our categories enable us to understand them. Wool posited God as the creator of our fundamental ideas. Because God had created them, these ideas matched reality. What is the British Association of Science? The purpose of the British Association of Science is to promote sustainability and make science and technology accessible to the public. However, on the organization's website they credit David Brewster, who invented the kaleidoscope in 1815, as its principal founder, not William Wool. The association now has about 3,000 members, is mainly concerned with the popularization of science, and sponsors a young scientist program that has about 12,000 members. Each year since 1932, the British Association of Science has held a Festival of Science, featuring hundreds of speakers. You can learn more about their current activities at http colon slash slash the dash ba dot net slash the hyphen ba. Who were the philosophs? The term philosophican and has been applied to virtually all intellectuals who advocated 
change in the world order during the decades leading up to the American and French revolutions. In that sense, David Hume, Jeremy Bentham, and Benjamin Franklin were all philosophes. However, to tell a manageable history of philosophy it is useful to narrow the term down to the French encyclopedists and Adam Smith, Edward Gibbon, Gotthold Lessing, and Cesare Beccaria. What were Augusta Cohn's sociological ideas? Cohn believed that in all the sciences, there are three historical phases. Theological, metaphysical, and scientific or positive. The theological phase contains religious restrictions and belief in the supernatural. The metaphysical phase involves the justification of political rights above authority. In the scientific phase, solutions to social problems can be found. By combining these laws of phases, Kohn developed an encyclopedic law according to which all of the sciences could be ordered into a hierarchy in which sociology was the greatest and included all of the others. Kohn wrote, if it is true that every theory must be based upon observed facts, it is equally true that facts cannot be observed without the guidance of some theories. He thus posited an interconnection between facts and theories, which holds to this day. Who was F? H. Bradley Francis Herbert, F. H. Bradley, 1846-1924, was a main architect of 19th century British idealism but he was also highly influential as an intuitionist. His principal work was Ethical Studies, 1876, in which he sought to explain how morality can be part of individual consciousness and social institutions. He argued that individuals believe that morality is an intrinsic value, which, depending on their social status, they self-realize in their actions. Good selves could be actualized only if bad selves were suppressed. Therefore, the good self requires the bad self and morality can never be completely actualized unless oneself dies through surrender to Christianity. Did Augusta Cohn believe in altruism? Yes. In fact, Cohn coined the word altruism, meaning an obligation to help and serve others. Even at cost or harm to one's own self-interests. What was 19th century intuitionism? To some extent all philosophical systems have a place for intuition. Direct knowledge that is non-inferential or cannot be proved by prior argument and for which there is no way to resolve doubts. Mill thought that William Wools, 1794 to 1866, 
philosophy of science was intuitive. Although it was in places quite inferential. However, Wuol did have an explicitly intuitionist moral theory. Other noteworthy 19th century intuitionists were William Hamilton, F. H. Bradley, Henry Sidgwick, James Martineau, and, toward the end of the century and into the next, Henry Bergson. What was F? H. Bradley like as a person? Bradley was made a fellow at Merton College, Oxford. In 1870. This was a lifetime position with no teaching duties, which only marriage could terminate. Bradley never married, and he lived on campus until he died. A kidney inflammation in 1871 left him careful of his health. And although he participated in the governance of the college, he avoided other social occasions. For instance, he turned down an opportunity to be a founder of the British Academy. Bradley detested cats and shot them on the college grounds, during the night. R.G. Collingwood His neighbor for 16 years, later wrote. Although I lived within a few hundred yards of him, I never to my knowledge set eyes on him. What was the goal of the encyclopedists? The goal of the encyclopedists was to gather together in a collection of contemporary volumes, everything known at the time in all fields. Their main contributors were Denis Diderot, 1713 to 1784, Jean L. E. Ron D'Alembert, 1717 to 1783, Baron Paul Henry Dietrich de Holbach, 1723 to 1789, and Charles Louis de Secondat, Baron de la Brie de T. de Montesquieu, 1689 to 1755, as well as Jean Jacques Rousseau. 1712 to 1778 and Voltaire 1694 to 1778 Their work was humanistic and scientifically inclined However its anti-clerical themes resulted in royal censorship in 1750 Although the project endured until 1777 there were 140 contributors and almost 150 additional writers and engravers to the project. The 32 volumes produced had more than 70,000 entries, with 11 volumes of plates and 21 of printed text. How did William Wool think consilience, coherence, and predictions should be applied to test theories? Scientific theories must withstand the tests of consilience, coherence, and prediction. Consilience refers to new kinds of cases confirming the theory. A theory's coherence is its ability to explain new kinds of facts. The theory's coherence ought to increase over time. Predictions should turn out to be accurate. Once they have withstood such tests, theories, and basic scientific principles become 
necessary it is a contradiction to deny them, given an understanding of their meaning. How did the facts of Wollstonecraft's life obscure her work? Mary Wollstonecraft's life was tumultuous in a way that was shocking to her peers and many later thinkers. Her husband, the philosopher William Godwin, 1756-1836, wrote the memoirs of the author of A Vindication. Of the rights of woman a year after Mary had died in childbirth at the age of 37. Godwin the founder of modern anarchism, was vilified by the poet Robert Southey for the want of all feeling in stripping his dead wife naked. And in a satire called The Unsexed Females, a poem, 1798, published by Richard Polbley. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields, London and her father squandered their money and took over her own small inheritance. He drank excessively and beat Mary's mother. Her sisters, Everina and Eliza, were also to have unhappy marriages. In her teens, Mary became friends with Jane Arden, whose family had intellectual interests, and Fanny Blood with whom she later started a school in Newington Green, which was known as a dissenting community. Blood married, became ill, and died. The school fell apart, and Wollstonecraft worked as a governess. Leaving after a year when she decided to support herself by writing. This was a very daring ambition for a woman at the time. And Wollstonecraft called herself the first of a new genus. In London, she was assisted by the publisher Joseph Johnson. She became part of a circle that included Thomas Paine and William Godwin. And supported herself by translating French and German texts after learning those languages. She had an affair with the married artist Henry Fuseli, who rejected her when his wife refused a Platonic menage à trois. She then wrote Vindication of the Rights of Men, 1790, followed by Vindication of the Rights of Women. 1792, and traveled to France a month before Louis XVI was guillotined. There she fell in love with the adventurer Gilbert Imlay, with whom she had her daughter, Fanny. Imlay rejected Mary, and when she returned to England she twice tried to commit suicide. Eventually, she became romantically attached to Godwin and they married so that their child would be legitimate, though they lived in separate houses. Their daughter, Mary, became Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Fanny committed suicide at the age of 22. Who was Henry Sidgwick? Henry Sidgwick, 1838-1900, was not so much an intuitionist as the first modern moral theorist who used a combination of common sense and shared intuitions to assess the competing moral theories of his day. As a professor at Cambridge University, he was active in founding Nunham, the first college for women. His wife, Eleanor Mildred Balfour, 
whose brother, Arthur, was later Prime Minister of England. Became Principal of Nunum in 1892. The Sidgwicks collaborated on many reform and intellectual projects. Including investigations into parapsychology. Sidgwick's principal works are The Methods of Ethics, 1874, and Outlines of the History of Ethics, 1886. What was individually noteworthy about Diderot, D'Alembert, Hallback, and Montesquieu? Denis Diderot, 1713-1784, was the general editor of the Encyclopedia. His The Skeptic's Walk, 1747, was a robust attack on Christianity. His claim that the universe was wholly material and evolving. As asserted in Letter on the Blind, 1749, resulted in a brief imprisonment. Diderot's comedies were considered second-rate. But his literary analyses created the new genre of literary criticism. Jean L. E. Ron D'Alembert, 1717-1783, was the chief philosopher in the Encyclopedists project. In his Discars Preliminaire he divided a philosophy of man into pneumatology or the human soul, logic, and ethics. He held that the substance of the universe cannot be known, and in Essay on the Elements of Philosophy. 1759, defined the field as a comparison of phenomena, that is, appearances. Baron Paul Henry Dietrich D. Holbach, 1723-1789, was a major contributor to the encyclopedia. He was a solicitor at the Paris Parliament and hosted philosophical dinners. He systematized Diderot's naturalism and published anonymous. Irreligious treatises applying philosophy against the Catholic Church. He argued that everything in existence was based on matter and motion in a completely determined universe. Holbach thought that Christian virtues were unnatural, that piety was fanaticism, and that church officials were immoral. He was also a utilitarian. Baron de la Bride et de Montesquieu, Charles Louis de Secondat. 1689-1755, was the chief political encyclopedist. His most famous work is The Spirit of the Laws. 1740-1748, in which he argued that governments can be divided into republics. Monarchies, or despotisms, which are respectively motivated by political virtue, honor, and fear. Types of government depend on the character, history, and geography of a people. A constitutional government with a separation of executive, legislative, and judicial powers is the only form that can protect liberty. This idea influenced the framers of the U.S. Constitution. What were Wollstonecraft's main political ideas? In Vindication of the Rights of Men 1790, she argued against Irish statesman and political theorist Edmund Burke's 
1789-1797, conservative attack on the ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. Her claim that Burke's endorsement of custom and tradition implied that slavery was acceptable made her famous overnight. Vindication of the Rights of Women, 1792, in which Wollstonecraft sounded a clarion call. For the recognition of women as human beings, was innovative in its progressive thought. What were William Wool's main ideas? Wool posited certain fundamental ideas, such as space, time, cause, and resemblance, which enabled unconscious inference so that we could structure and relate our sensations in ways that resulted in our perceptions of objects. He thought that each science has a distinct particular fundamental idea that makes sense of its subject matter. For instance, the idea of space for geometry, cause for mechanics, and substance for chemistry. The fundamental idea of a science can be further modified to fit the requirements of that science. Such as the idea of force as a modification of the idea of cause in mechanics. Why was Adam Smith's work important? Adam Smith, 1723-1790, defined the economic system of capitalism and at the same time founded the science of modern economics in his An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, 1776. He sought to answer the question of how nations grow richer. Assuming that human life would improve as nations prospered. He analyzed the importance of the ongoing division of labor in the industrialization process. And argued for free competition based on the profit motive. This would be a system of economic liberty or laissez-faire, let them do it. He argued that selfishness in acquiring wealth would result in better conditions for all. Through the invisible hand of the marketplace. How did John Stuart Mill define the difference between higher and lower pleasures? Mill did not think that a simple quantitative calculus could be used to make moral decisions. He argued that there were lower pleasures that were mainly connected with immediate physical gratification and delight. And higher pleasures that involved delayed gratification or prior diligence. The higher pleasures, such as those found in the cultivation and enjoyment of art, literature, poetry, and friendship, were better than the lower pleasures. Mill's proof that they were better was the testimony of those who had experienced both the lower and higher pleasures. What was the Sidgwick's interest in the paranormal?
Henry Sidgwick helped found the Society for Psychical Research in 1892, and his wife. Eleanor, was an active participant. The Sidgwicks believed that the work of society could help confirm religious claims. Such as life after death. They believed that an afterlife was necessary as a motivation for morality in this life. However, their investigations were inconclusive. Even though Eleanor believed that Henry communicated with her after his death in 1900. What was the Sidgwick's interest in the paranormal? Henry Sidgwick helped found the Society for Psychical Research in 1892, and his wife. Eleanor, was an active participant. The Sidgwicks believed that the work of society could help confirm religious claims. Such as life after death. They believed that an afterlife was necessary as a motivation for morality in this life. However, their investigations were inconclusive. Even though Eleanor believed that Henry communicated with her after his death in 1900. What is moral theory? Moral theory is the intellectual assessment and comparison of different moral or ethical systems. For instance, if we compare consequentialism and deontology, then we are working within moral theory. To some extent, anyone who argues for their own moral system does some amount of moral theory. For example, Jeremy Bentham, 1748 to 1832, in his dismissal of human rights as nonsense upon stilts, wanted to replace discourse about rights with calculations about pleasure. And Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, in distinguishing between hypothetical and categorical judgments and elevating the latter, were both engaged in moral theory. What is moral theory? Moral theory is the intellectual assessment and comparison of different moral or ethical systems. For instance, if we compare consequentialism and deontology, then we are working within moral theory. To some extent, anyone who argues for their own moral system does some amount of moral theory. For example, Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, in his dismissal of human rights as nonsense upon stilts, wanted to replace discourse about rights with calculations about pleasure. And Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, in distinguishing between hypothetical and categorical judgments and elevating the latter, were both engaged in moral theory. What did Henry Sidgwick contribute to moral theory? First, Sidgwick is considered to have offered the clearest exposition of the 
classic utilitarianism of Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, and John Stuart Mill. 1806-1873, to such an extent that he is often counted as a utilitarian himself. But second, it is his comparative assessment of egoism. Utilitarianism, and intuitionism that remains most instructive. Egoism is the moral system according to which we should always act in our own self-interest. Sidgwick examined both common sense moral principles and the main claims of all three systems and concluded that none is self-evident or certain according to intuition. He thought that utilitarianism could be useful when we do not know what to do and seek guidance. But that the basic principles of utilitarianism depend on intuition for their acceptance. But egoism also seems self-evident, and it often conflicts with utilitarianism. Sidgwick admitted that he could not resolve this contradiction. What did Henry Sidgwick contribute to moral theory? First, Sidgwick is considered to have offered the clearest exposition of the Classic Utilitarianism of Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, and John Stuart Mill. 1806-1873, to such an extent that he is often counted as a utilitarian himself. But second, it is his comparative assessment of egoism. Utilitarianism, and intuitionism that remains most instructive. Egoism is the moral system according to which we should always act in our own self-interest. Sidgwick examined both common sense moral principles and the main claims of all. Three systems and concluded that none is self-evident or certain according to intuition. He thought that utilitarianism could be useful when we do not know what to do and seek guidance. But that the basic principles of utilitarianism depend on intuition for their acceptance. But egoism also seems self evident, and it often conflicts with utilitarianism. Sidgwick admitted that he could not resolve this contradiction. Who was James Martineau? James Martineau, 1805-1900, was an English religious intuitionist. His main works were types of ethical theory. 1885, and a study of religion, 1888. His distinct contribution was to develop a specifically religious interpretation of Immanuel Kant's. 1724 to 1804 metaphysics Who was James Martineau James Martineau 1805 to 1900 was an English religious intuitionist. His main works were types of ethical theory. 1885, and a study of religion, 1888. His distinct contribution was to develop a specifically religious interpretation of Immanuel Kant's. 
1724-1804, Metaphysics. How did James Martineau make Immanuel Kant's metaphysics religious? Martineau relied on intuition to claim that the phenomenal world mirrors a noumenal world. The world of things we cannot experience, in which real objects are causally related. He held that this reality is the result of God's will. In ethics he claimed that we choose our motives first and then our actions. Intuition tells us which ones are the higher motives and that the highest one is reverence. He meant that the desire to revere motivates our best actions. How did James Martineau make Immanuel Kant's metaphysics religious? Martineau relied on intuition to claim that the phenomenal world mirrors a noumenal world. The world of things we cannot experience, in which real objects are causally related. He held that this reality is the result of God's will. In ethics he claimed that we choose our motives first and then our actions. Intuition tells us which ones are the higher motives and that the highest one is reverence. He meant that the desire to revere motivates our best actions. Who was Henri Bergson? Henry Bergson, 1859-1941 Was professor at the Collège de France and winner of the 1927 Nobel Prize for Literature. He is most famous for his time and free will, 1889, in which he argued that objective measurable time, which can be divided into equal segments, is not the same as real time, which we experience directly. In Matter and Memory, 1896, he offered a mind-body theory consistent with his later work on evolution in which he argued that a creative urge, rather than Darwinian natural selection, is what causes evolution. In an introduction to metaphysics, 1903, he provided further support for his theory of time. In Creative Evolution, 1907, he claimed that a life force is necessary to explain evolution. And in Two Sources of Morality and Religion, 1935, he claimed that there are two kinds of society. One free and allowing for reform and creativity, the other stagnant, conservative, and repressive. Who was Henri Bergson? Henry Bergson, 1859-1941 Was professor at the Collège de France and winner of the 1927 Nobel Prize for Literature. He is most famous for his time and free will, 1889, in which he argued that objective measurable time, which can be divided into equal segments, is not the same as real time, which we experience directly. In Matter and Memory, 1896, 
he offered a mind-body theory consistent with his later work on evolution in which he argued that a creative urge, rather than Darwinian natural selection, is what causes evolution. In an introduction to metaphysics, 1903, he provided further support for his theory of time. In Creative Evolution, 1907, he claimed that a life force is necessary to explain evolution. And in Two Sources of Morality and Religion, 1935, he claimed that there are two kinds of society. One free and allowing for reform and creativity, the other stagnant, conservative, and repressive. What did Henri Bergson have to say about laughter and the human sense of humor? Bergson wrote a 1900 analysis of laughter, which shows he was pretty interested in the concept of humor. He thought that the comical is a part of life that cannot be fully understood by reason alone. Laughter requires a state of indifference, according to Bergson. For laughter has no greater foe than emotion. He went on to say that the comic demands something like a momentary anesthesia of the heart. IT's appeal is to intelligence pure and simple. To be comical, something must be rigid like a facial grimace or a mechanical walk. Our perception of this rigidity is broken up by our laughter. Ordinary language bears Bergson out on this because we talk about being cracked up. Or broken up when something is funny. Anything that switches our attention from the soul or moral realm to the body can be comical. Said Bergson, for example, a speaker sneezing at a dramatic moment in his presentation. Bergson saw the overall purpose of comedy as a reassertion of life in an age of machines. What did Henri Bergson have to say about laughter and the human sense of humor? Bergson wrote a 1900 analysis of laughter, which shows he was pretty interested in the concept of humor. He thought that the comical is a part of life that cannot be fully understood by reason alone. Laughter requires a state of indifference, according to Bergson. For laughter has no greater foe than emotion. He went on to say that the comic demands something like a momentary anesthesia of the heart. IT's appeal is to intelligence pure and simple. To be comical, something must be rigid, like a facial grimace or a mechanical walk. Our perception of this rigidity is broken up by our laughter. Ordinary language bears Bergson out on this because we talk about being cracked up. Or broken up when something is funny. Anything that switches our attention from the soul or moral realm to the body can be comical. Said Bergson, for example, a speaker sneezing at a dramatic moment in his presentation. Bergson saw the overall purpose of comedy as a reassertion of life in an age of machines. How did Henri Bergson relate real time to free will?
real time, according to Bergson. Cannot be imagined as points on a line in space, like scientific clock time. Real time is intuited directly and within us, it is the ground of spontaneous free acts. Our free will is our spontaneous free acts, which are unpredictable. Intuition and analysis parallel this distinction. Intuition apprehends duration directly and examines it. Whereas analysis breaks duration up into unchanging concepts. How did Henri Bergson relate real time to free will? Real time, according to Bergson, cannot be imagined as points on a line in space, like scientific clock time. Real time is intuited directly and within us, it is the ground of spontaneous free acts. Our free will is our spontaneous free acts, which are unpredictable. Intuition and analysis parallel this distinction. Intuition apprehends duration directly and examines it. Whereas analysis breaks duration up into unchanging concepts. Why did philosophers become interested in mathematics, geometry, and logic? during the 19th century. Philosophers have always been interested in these subjects. But in the 19th century there were even more innovations in science and technology than before. Changes in the world had an invigorating effect on higher learning and philosophers took an interest in new research in the sciences and mathematics. Logic had been a philosophical subject since Aristotle. So new forms of logic were of interest to many philosophers who were not logicians. Why did philosophers become interested in mathematics, geometry, and logic, during the 19th century? Philosophers have always been interested in these subjects. But in the 19th century there were even more innovations in science and technology than before. Changes in the world had an invigorating effect on higher learning. And philosophers took an interest in new research in the sciences and mathematics. Logic had been a philosophical subject since Aristotle. So new forms of logic were of interest to many philosophers who were not logicians. What advances were made during the 19th century concerning the philosophy of mathematics and logic? During the 19th century, a logical theory of probability was propounded. Non-Euclidean geometry was discovered, the objectivity and necessary truth of scientific first principles were questioned. A new system of logical notation was devised. And the possibility that mathematics could be reduced to logic was introduced.
what advances were made during the 19th century concerning the philosophy of mathematics and logic. During the 19th century, a logical theory of probability was propounded. Non-Euclidean geometry was discovered, the objectivity and necessary truth of scientific first principles were questioned. A new system of logical notation was devised. And the possibility that mathematics could be reduced to logic was introduced. Who was Pierre-Simon Laplace? Pierre-Simon Laplace, 1749-1827, was a mathematician and astronomer who explicated what was to be the classic theory of probability. He taught in Paris at different schools, such as the École Militaire, military school. Who was Pierre-Simon Laplace? Pierre-Simon Laplace, 1749-1827, was a mathematician and astronomer who explicated what was to be the classic theory of probability. He taught in Paris at different schools, such as the École Militaire, military school. What is Pierre Simon Laplace's theory of probability? The fact that we do not know certain things gives rise to the idea of probabilities. Because we view the world as determined in assuming that every event has a cause. The probability of an event depends on a combination of what we do know and what we do not know. Laplace's theory of probability was that if there is no reason to believe that one of a number of events n, will occur, then the probability of each happening is 1 slash n. For example, the probability that any day of the week chosen at random will be either a Tuesday or a Thursday is 2 sevenths. What is Pierre-Simon Laplace's theory of probability? The fact that we do not know certain things gives rise to the idea of probabilities. Because we view the world as determined in assuming that every event has a cause. The probability of an event depends on a combination of what we do know and what we do not know. Laplace's theory of probability was that if there is no reason to believe that one of a number of events n will occur, then the probability of each happening is 1 slash n. For example, the probability that any day of the week chosen at random will be either a Tuesday or a Thursday is two-sevenths.